Welcome back everyone. Now we're ready to talk about the ratio test. Of all of the convergence tests that we've computed in this lecture series, I would say that the ratio test is probably my favorite of all of them. So it's sort of like the, be the best for less right here. And the ratio test gets its name for the following reason. I want you to consider the sequence of ratios. So you have some sequence A sub N like you see right here. I want you to take the ratio of consecutive terms. So take the term a n and divide it from its successor a n plus one, or if you want to think of it, take, take a term in the sequence and divide it by its predecessor. So take the ratio sequence of consecutive terms. Also take absolute value because we don't really care about positive or negative right here. And so take the limit of the ratio. So take the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus one over a n all inside absolute value. Let's say that this sequence is convergent. So the sequence of ratios is converges to some limit value, call it L. So that's how the ratio test gets its name. We have to compute the limit of this ratio. Now, if that limit is less than one, then we can conclude by the ratio test that the series n equals one to infinity, the sum of a sub n is absolutely convergent. Now, remember what absolute convergence here means? It means that if you take the sum of absolute values, that's a convergent series. But as we've seen with the test of absolute convergence, that if a series is absolute convergent, then it's, con it's convergent as well. And so the ratio test doesn't just give us convergence, it actually gives us absolute convergence if this limit is less than one. Now, uh, be aware that we, get, we can get away with absolute, ver absolute convergence here, because again, we're kind of taking absolute values. It's built into the mechanism of the ratio test here. And this limit right here is basically measuring how close together uh, are the terms in the sequence. How rapidly is the sequence of ratios shrinking? Because if this thing is shrinking rapidly enough, then its limit will be something less than one. I should say that if the terms in the sequence are close enough together, and that's gonna give us that this sum right here will be convergent because the terms a n are shrinking at a rapid enough rate. That's, that's what we're gonna get from this limit right here. Now, on the other hand, if the limit is greater than one, if the limit of the ratios is greater than one, then this tells us that the series is in fact divergent, right? It'll be a divergent series. And the other possibility is if the limit of ratios is equal to one, then the ratio test is actually inconclusive. It turns out in that situation, the series could be absolutely convergent. It could be convergent, but not absolutely. That is, it could be conditionally convergent or it actually could be divergent. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a second. Uh, but let me show you some affirmative situations first. So if we're gonna test, uh, if we're gonna, we're gonna try the testing the convergence of a series, we're gonna use the ratio test here. Take the sum where n equals one to infinity of the alternating series negative one to the n, you have n cubed over three to the n. Now you'll notice here some things going on here. There's this geometric part, three to the n, but this is not a geometric series. There's this like n cube floating around, but this is not a P series. And there's also this negative one to the n. It is actually an alternating series. Um, so one could try to determine whether this thing is convergent by the alternating series test, which you could be successful in doing that. But one advantage of using the ratio test here is that the alternating series test can only show convergence, but the ratio test can show absolute convergence. And then frankly, it might actually be able to do it in an easier fashion. So, how does one actually work this thing out? We wanna consider the, the ratio sequence. Take a sub n divided by a n. And so oftentimes what happens is that the terms in your sequence are actually fractions. So when I actually work at this, sometimes I actually wanna take the a n plus one term and then kind of separate, separate it as a one over a n term because these terms are often both fractions themselves. So the a n plus one is gonna look like the following. We have negative one, to the n plus one power, we're gonna get n plus one, uh, let me rewrite that, we're gonna get n plus one cubed all over three to the n plus one, like so, that's the first term. And then the next term is gonna look like taking the reciprocal, we get three n on top, and then we're gonna get a negative one to the n times n cubed, like so. And so we wanna simplify this thing, that's the next thing we have to do, is we have to simplify this expression now, some things to mention here is that since you're taking absolute values, any factors of negative one can just be entirely ignored. It does not matter whether we're positive or negative, those negative signs will always disappear with the absolute value. The next thing I wanna mention is that you wanna rewrite this fraction, putting things of similar type together. 
Like notice how there's this exponential term three to the n, and there's this three to the n plus one. I want you to rewrite it so that those two friends are now together. So we have three to the n over three to the n plus one. And then the other terms, we have this n plus one cubed and this n cubed, those are kind of the same type. Put them together as your next fraction, you're gonna get n plus one cubed over n cubed, like so. And again, now we're gonna to try to simplify these things because when you look at three n plus one on the bottom here, this thing can break apart as three to the n times three. And so this three to the n cancels with that three to the n and you're left with the absolute value of one third, which is actually just a one third right here. Now with the second bit, n plus one cubed over n cubed, both the numerator and denominator are being cubed. And so if we bring out the exponential, we're gonna end up with n plus one over n cubed. Or rewriting it one more time, we get one third, we're gonna get one plus one over n quantity cubed here. And so in this situation, as we take the limit, as n goes to infinity, because again, that's what we're trying to do here. We want to take the limit, right? So this is a limit calculation, the limit as n goes to infinity. Um, if you carry that through all of these calculations, we get to the very end here. We take the limit as n goes to infinity. Well, as n goes to infinity, the one third will stay one third, the plus one will stay there. This one over n part will vanish to zero. And so we end up with this, this, this sequence of ratios will converge towards one third times one cubed. And which of course that would then just become the number one third, like so. This is the limit L that we saw with the ratio test. This is the limit of the ratios, all right? And so because it's the limit of the ratios, we wanna compare with the ratio test. The ratio test, if we bring it back over here, if our limit is less than one, this says the series is absolutely convergent. And that's exactly what we see over here. This limit is less than one. And so then we conclude by the ratio test that our series is absolutely convergent. And since it's absolutely convergent, that actually implies it's convergent. So if you're asked, is the series convergent? You would say, yes, it's convergent. If you want to, if you could also further specify it's absolutely convergent and we use the ratio test in so doing. Uh, as another example, let's take the let's take the sum of n equals one to infinity of n to the n over n factorial. Now this is not an alternating series, uh, so we couldn't use the alternating series test. Um, this n factorial makes it very difficult to integrate because what's the antiderivative of x factorial? E you know that's that's kind of a weird thing. That that's not a continuous function that we can find an antiderivative of. But the ratio test actually works out really great in this situation because our ratio test, again, we're looking at the ratio of a n plus one over a n. This is gonna look like n plus one to the n plus one power over n plus one factorial. That's the a n plus one term. And then if you look at the one over a n term, that's gonna be n factorial over n to the n. And like we did last time, put together similar types. Like we're gonna put the factorials together and then put the exponential expressions together as well. If we do the factorials, we end up with n factorial over n plus one factorial. And that's gonna be paired up with the n plus one to the n plus one over n to the n, like so. All right, now, much like we've done the previous example, these ratios have to be simplified in some manner. Now, n plus one factorial has a very nice factorization as a factorial. This will factor as n plus one times n factorial, for which the n factorials then cancel right here. And then another sort of curious thing here is that you have an n plus one. The n plus one that's in the denominator can actually cancel with one of the n plus ones that are over here. And so this ratio simplifies to be n plus one to the n above n to the n. And much like our last example, since we now have, they're both to the power of n, we can bring that out of our fraction and get n plus one over n to the n right here. Uh, and simplifying this, we're gonna get one plus one over n to the n. Now this one's a little bit more tricky um, because we can't, uh, if we just set n to infinity, right? You're gonna end up with, uh, this thing will look like, this thing would look like one to the infinity, which is actually an indeterminate form. Um, so this kind of leads to the L'Hopital argument.
um, for which if you want, you can see the, the video uh, link that's in front of the screen right now. You can actually see why this calculation turns out the way it is, but this limit will turn out to be the number E, uh, which E is approximately 2.7, et cetera, et cetera. This is our limit value and it is actually greater than one. So what this tells us by the ratio test, the ratio test would give that this series is going to be divergent. This is a divergent series by the ratio test. Divergent there. And so when we go back to the ratio test we saw here, if our limit's greater than one, the series is divergent. We're using that as, we're using that evidence right here. Now I should mention that in this last example, um, we found out that the limit the, the limit of the a n plus ones over a n's take absolute value there. If this limit goes off towards something, some L value, which is bigger than one, it turns out you actually didn't need to use the ratio test whatsoever. You actually could have gotten away with the test for divergence or the so-called divergence test, the test for divergence. Um, the reason that this limit goes to something bigger than one really comes from the fact that the sequence a sub n does not go towards zero. And if you look at the proof of the ratio test, that's why that's happening. So we actually could have used the divergence test in that situation. Uh, because again, going back to our sequence in play here, this n to the n over n factorial here, this isn't an obvious fact to us perhaps, but the thing is the top is growing at a faster rate than n factorial, that this thing actually converges towards infinity, right? It's not the fastest growing function necessarily, but ultimately n to the n, uh, the power exponential function beats the factorial. So we could have used the divergence test there as well. But, you know, that's the thing about the ratio test is that if it turns out that you get in this situation, you still get an answer, right? You don't just have to, all your effort isn't wasted. It's like, I could have used the divergence test, but since I didn't use it, and I went to the ratio test, I still get an answer as opposed to like the alternating series test, which it can tell you when the series is convergent. But if, if the alternating series test fails, that doesn't imply convergence. Um, you'll need, you'll actually have to do the divergence test in that situation. Um, I want to talk about at the, at the last part of our video here. I want to talk about this last case a little bit. What happens? What about when the ratio test is inconclusive, right? Well, I mean, if it's inconclusive, that means you need to do something else. Uh, but why do you need to do something else here? If it's inconclusive, we can draw no conclusions because of the following type of situations. If you take, if you take so the first example here, take the sum of one over n squared, right? In this situation, this series is convergent. It's a p-series. In fact, it's absolutely convergent because it's just a positive series there that's convergent. But if you look at the, the ratio sequence a n plus one over a n, uh, this thing is gonna look like n plus one squared over n squared, and that'll converge towards the number one. It's an absolutely convergent series, but, um, it, it, but the limit goes to one. So if that limit ratio of limit equals one, it could be that it's uh, uh, absolutely convergent. It could be. Um, another option, take something like the following, take the harmonic series one over N. Uh, in this situation, we know that the harmonic series is divergent, uh, but if you look at the ratio sequence, AN plus one over AN, this thing is gonna look like an plus one over n, which that likewise converges to one. So the limit when it's one, it could be absolutely convergent, which is convergent, uh, but it could also be divergent. And it turns out there is a third possibility, right? That if you take the sum of like say the alternating harmonic series, a n a negative one to the n plus one times one over n, this is actually an example of a conditionally convergent series. But in that situation, if you take a n plus one over a n, you still end up with uh, just the same thing you did here. You're gonna end up with a n plus one over n because the absolute values just negate the alternating fact. This is gonna go to one. So you can see that when, when this limit of ratios equals one, we truly are inconclusive because you can get absolutely convergent, you can get divergent, and you can get conditionally convergent. Now, one thing I should mention is that the conditionally convergent situation must occur in this case where the limit goes off to one but we could actually determine divergence or absolute convergence if the limit is greater than or less than one, depends on the situation. But be aware that if the limit of the ratios goes to one, you have to use a different test than the ratio test. So although I think the ratio test is super awesome, it does of course have some limitations 
particularly this this inconclusive case when the limit goes to one.